You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcast from the past decade with a teensy bit of humor, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. Up first on the docket, here's a show from the archives I think you will really enjoy. Today we have a single standout episode from Dateline titled A Wanted Man. Here's a synopsis from the show. Dr. Mark Weinberger and his wife Michelle were vacationing in the Greek islands when he vanished, leaving behind financial ruin and a growing number of malpractice suits. The question of his whereabouts remains unanswered for five years, until a woman halfway across the world discovers the truth. As per usual, go to the truecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter to see visual aids from this episode. With this story, it's especially satisfying to match the faces to the names and voices you hear on the show. Plus, it will be helpful for you to see the many looks of Mark Weinberger so you can avoid this human suck pump at all costs. My only knock on this episode is that Keith Morrison is not narrating it. But our host for the story, Rob Stafford, still delivers an excellent report. Bonus, we get some commentary from author Buzz Bissinger, the guy who wrote the book Friday Night Lights. He also wrote an article on this story for Vanity Fair, which I will link to in the newsletter. Buzz lends some of his signature color commentary to the episode, adding that extra spice to this true crime thriller. Side note, Buzz Bissinger gave an interview on Fresh Air back in 2015 about his reporting on Friday Night Lights and about his addiction to shopping and wearing expensive leather. It's a bizarre interview, but I was blown away by how honest and vulnerable he was, so I thought it was a refreshing change of pace to see a journalist being so open in an interview. So if you're interested to hear more about Buzz, check out that conversation on Fresh Air. He's a fascinating person. And now, let's get into this episode from Dateline, aka The Snuggie of True Crime. How does a show that details the worst of humanity manage to be so comfy cozy? We start aboard a yacht in Mykonos, Greece to celebrate Michelle Weinberger's 30th birthday. She's there with her husband, Mark, the perfect couple living their hashtag blessed life. Michelle details their whirlwind romance, lavish wedding, their life of luxury, traveling the world together in their private jet and fancy pants yacht. Mark has been promising her a big surprise for her birthday. How on earth is he going to top himself this year? Michelle is about to find out. The couple enjoys a romantic dinner above deck. They cap off the night with a champagne toast and retire below deck to the chamber of sleepings, or whatever the word is for a bedroom on a fancy yacht. The next morning, Michelle wakes up and turns over to see the other side of the bed is empty. Mark is gone. Michelle wanders up to query the captain about the whereabouts of her husband. The captain, in his deliciously thick Greek accent, tells Michelle... Ah, uh, your husband went to shore to buy you some expensive jewelry. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must finish my morning cup of olive oil. Take my word for it, he sounded exactly like that. So, Michelle has her breakfast and eagerly waits for her husband's return. One hour goes by, then two, then three. Michelle is getting anxious. Maybe something happened to her husband on shore. Someone could have seen him flashing around his wealth and robbed him. Michelle's mind started to spin with worry. The captain tried to reassure her. He should be back soon. Then the sun started to go down. Mark had been gone all day. Michelle was officially in panic mode. Maybe Mark had been kidnapped or murdered. 
She was beside herself having a meltdown. She finally decides it's time to call the police. That's when she gets a knock on the door from the captain. The captain was reluctant to inform Michelle that he had just gotten off the phone with a taxi driver on shore and that this driver insisted that he had driven Mark to the airport hours earlier and watched Mark board a private jet and take off. I'm afraid to tell you your husband is not coming back. And happy birthday! This was far from the surprise Michelle had been expecting. Her husband of three years had just left her. I think we've all had our fair share of crummy birthdays. But this one takes the cake. Michelle was stuck in Greece with just her passport and barely enough money to get home. When all is said and done, Michelle is left with about $1,500 to her name and a yacht load of questions. The number one being, who the bleep did I marry? And I'm left asking, how the bleep is Dateline so effing cozy? I started out this episode surrounded by a warm, soft Snuggie, and now somehow a mug of hibiscus berry tea has magically appeared, along with a cooling gel eye mask. Ah, Dateline, how do you do it? Ah, don't even bother answering. I'm just going to marvel at your splendor and continue to luxuriate in this story as we dive into the life and crimes of Mark Weinberger. Mark attended medical school at UCLA and then opened up a private practice in Maryville, Indiana, specializing in sinus surgery. According to your boy Buzz Bissinger, this was the perfectly calculated location for Mark the Nose Doctor to open up his practice because Maryville is home to both steelmaking and petroleum refinery plants. These industries produce a lot of pollution, resulting in poor air quality. Many of the folks who live and work in this area experience breathing and sinus issues. And bonus, a lot of these same folks who are connected to the mills have excellent insurance. So Dr. Mark Weinberger's sinus services were in high demand. Such high demand that he was performing 15 to 22 surgeries a week. That's about four times the amount of a typical one-man sinus surgeon practice. Mark Weinberger, a.k.a. Dr. Nose, was either superhuman or something about his practice really stinks. We hear from Valerie Thomas, whose eight-year-old daughter Kayla had been experiencing crippling headaches. Dr. Weinberger meets with Kayla. And just four days later, she is in surgery. But Kayla isn't getting any better. Dr. Weinberger blames Mother Valerie for not following post-surgery protocol, aka squirting saline solution in her daughter's nose. But Mother Valerie is suspicious of Kayla's deteriorating state. So she decides to get a second opinion. And those doctors are baffled that Dr. Weinberger performed sinus surgery on an eight-year-old. This little girl's issues were all due to a giant, non-cancerous brain tumor. Kayla undergoes another surgery, and doctors are unable to remove the entire tumor because the previous unnecessary surgery had left too much scar tissue behind in her sinus cavity. She survives the surgery, but poor little Kayla is in for a long, painful road to recovery. (sighs) Did things get uh, chilly in here all of a sudden? I'm not really feeling so cozy anymore. Uh, And things are about to get even more chilling. Next, we meet Phyllis Barnes, a lifelong smoker who started having trouble breathing. Side note, I've known a couple of Phyllises, and they were some of the most pure, delightful humans I've ever met. And this Phyllis sounds like she fits that same mold. She attributed her issues to sinuses and sought treatment from Dr. Weinberger. He immediately diagnoses Phyllis and recommends surgery. Her sister is there for her in the waiting room and is a little suspicious that her surgery only took 30 minutes. A week goes by and it's clear that Phyllis wasn't getting any better. 
She calls Dr. Weinberger to have a follow-up about her treatment and expresses her concerns that things seem to be getting worse. Dr. Weinberger laughs at her and gives her the oh-so-helpful advice that these things just take time. Phyllis also gets a second opinion from another doctor who, after only a brief cursory examination, immediately identifies two masses on Phyllis's throat. A biopsy confirms she had advanced throat cancer. Dr. Weinberger either completely ignored the obvious masses or he didn't even examine her at all. And what on earth kind of, quote, surgery did this guy perform on her? Ugh, things have gone too far. In addition to harming multiple patients, he's messed with an eight-year-old and a kind woman named Phyllis. So from here on out, I'm calling him Dr. Wine Booger. By 2004, lots of other people are starting to sniff this guy out. Dr. Weinbooker has been negligent and reckless with too many patients, and now there are pending lawsuits against him, threatening to take down his practice and his life of luxury. In addition to these disgruntled former patients, Michelle is uncovering more of her estranged husband's secrets. She discovers there was a, quote, scary room in his office. He left behind a lot of incriminating evidence that shows that he had been planning his escape for months. According to your boy Buzz Bissinger, Michelle and authorities investigating Weinberger discovered, quote, three portable shower kits, a waterproof wallet, a passport holder, a set of plates, cups, and cutlery in its own netting, two small compasses, a portable vinyl sink, a portable headlight, a five-language translator, a pocket weather tracker, a Garmin color map navigator with European software, an antimicrobial water bottle, a bubble padded sleeping mat, backpacks, thermal underwear, a knit hat, glove liners, and much more. And also, ironically, Mark left behind a book called How to Be Invisible, all about disappearing without a trace. Why would he leave all this evidence and that book behind? Pretty bad at following directions, wine booger. We hear from Mark's office manager who recalls a jeweler from the city making a trip to the practice to deliver Mark some uncut gems. <clears throat> I mean, uncut gems. The perfect way to launder money and travel inauspiciously with your wealth in tow. He had accumulated a lot of cash in a short period of time, billing $13 million to insurance. In Weinberger surgery rooms, he had state-of-the-art tools to do multiple surgeries in a day with a remote arm that he would control on a screen. You know, kind of like a fun video game, but you're mutilating people and moving through patients like they're on a production line. Okay, it's freezing in here now. I thought I was tuning into a warm and cozy episode of Dateline, not naked and afraid. I guess in order to bring back those snuggy vibes, we're going to have to track down this phony snot doc once and for all. Michelle finds a shredded document in her ex-hubby's office. She tapes it back together to discover the address of a fancy hotel casino in Paris. Ah, uh, yes, a secret sexy French spy mission. Michelle flies to Paris, but she's a day late. Weinbooger had snot rocketed away. But Michelle and Mark's other victims are undeterred. They do everything they can to spread the word about Mark, filming news segments, including a spot on America's Most Wanted, in the hopes that someday someone out there would spot Mark and turn this boogeyman in once and for all. Jump forward to 2009 to the tiny mountainside Italian village of Cormier, set nestled into the side of the mighty Mont Blanc. A stranger comes to town, going by the name Mark Stern. He tells the locals he's writing a book on survival. Mark befriends and has a romance with local mountaineer Monica. They bond over American music. Meeting Monica was my favorite part of the episode, especially hearing her enthusiasm for the Beastie Boys. I want a recording of her saying, fight for your right to party, to be my new ringtone. And this is only the beginning of the heroic stuff Monica does in the story. 
She falls hard for Mark. He promises that they will live together happily ever after. But first, he needs to complete one last survival mission for his book. Mark is going to camp alongside Mount Blanc for the next two months and document his sheer strength and survival heroism. And it would also be really cool if Monica could trek out to him every few days to bring him provisions. I picture Monica making the harrowing journey up the steep icy mountain to bring Mark cans of Campbell soup and hot cocoa and replenishing his collection of DVDs for his portable player so he can stay entertained. While Mark is tucked away in his warm, toasty tent, staying cozier than me tuning into an episode of Dateline, Monica happens to tune in to another true crime show. She gets a tip from a friend that her new beau Mark might not be who she thinks he is. Again, Monica knows Mark by the last name Stern, but his rental agreement on his Cormier flat lists the name Mark Weinberger. Monica Googles that name and sees the episode pop up of America's Most Wanted. She immediately calls the Italian authorities and they track him down. Mark is brought in for questioning, but he narrowly escapes when he tries to stab himself in the throat. He lives through this dramatic self-inflicted injury, which was honestly probably done more carefully than the reckless surgery he performed on his patients. Mark recovers and he's extradited to the U.S., where he goes on trial facing over 300 counts of fraud and malpractice. Mark is sentenced to seven years, but spends less than four in prison. I think he should have been sentenced to perform sinus care on hungry alligators. But hey, that's just me. So what's Mark up to now? He's living in Florida, but instead of working with gators, he's a yoga marketing lifestyle coach. You guys, you can pay 200 bucks a pop and take Mark's yoga training to get in tip-top shape in order to, quote, look good naked and get hot chicks. Ugh, what a feeb. This guy is worse than canned tuna in a pasta carbonara. But I am glad his name and face are out there, thanks to his brave victims and excellent reporting. We owe it to them that Mark Weinberger will forever have the reputation of being a complete snot rag. And I, for one, feel warm and comforted by that fact. Ah, Dateline, you've done it again. Thanks for going on this journey with me. I have so many more favorite Dateline stories that I will cover in future episodes, but I would love to hear some of your favorites and your thoughts on today's story. Get in touch with me directly at Angela at thetruecrimefeed.com or join the True Crime Feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and be kind to fellow True Crime Feed friends. Stay tuned till after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show. Like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent one woman show, and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now back to the show. And we're back. Before we start the official ranking, I have started the King Road Killings, not vibing with the host's style of storytelling, but the story itself has me enthralled. So I'm going to tune into every episode in spite the narration not being my preferred flavor. And with that being said, let's get down to business. Here are the three shows currently trending that I think are worth a listen. I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. At the number three spot, we have Under the Cover of Night. Here's a synopsis from the show. In 1996, Sue Knight was found dead in her Athens, Texas home. Her will named a loose acquaintance as the executor of her estate. But after an alleged phone call from the CIA and a dire warning from the local sheriff, 
the executor stopped asking questions. More than 25 years later, Sue's memory haunts the town of Athens and the people who knew her. Who was Sue really? Why did this English expat settle in a small town in Texas? And could she still be alive? The first two episodes of this show came out this week, and I have been loving previous original Apple true crime podcasts. So I think we're in for a wild ride with Under the Cover of Night. At the number two spot, we once again have Freeway Phantom. Here's a summary from the show. Between 1971 and 1972, six black girls went missing in the Washington, D.C. area. Their bodies were discarded alongside D.C. freeways, and their killer has never been found. The media dubbed him the Freeway Phantom. As of this writing, I am on episode four, but I will be fully caught up by the time this show airs. Freeway Phantom is really good, but it's a hard listen. I usually can't handle tuning into any kind of violence and sexual assault against children. That's why I haven't been able to stomach Betrayal Season 2. However, the reporting on Freeway Phantom is so well done that I can get through the tough parts in service to the story. Even though this case is 50 years old, there is an urgency and a momentum behind it. You can hear it in the voices of their surviving families and the former lead detective, Romaine Jenkins. It feels like this case is about to be solved once and for all, and you are going to want to be there tuning in when that happens. So don't miss Freeway Phantom. At the number one spot, we have the 13th step. Here's a synopsis from the show. Reporter Lauren Chulgin starts getting tips about the founder of New Hampshire's largest addiction treatment network. He is allegedly sexually harassing or assaulting women, employees, and former clients at his facilities. The tip sends Lauren on a journey deep into the addiction treatment industry, which, as one source says, needs a, quote, hashtag Me Too movement. Dude, this one came out of nowhere and hit me hard. All of the episodes dropped at once, and I binged the entire show in one day. Living in Maine, this show feels like it's taking place in my backyard. But even if you aren't a New Englander, this show will hit close to home for you too because I think we've all had a personal tie to addiction with friends, family, or even ourselves. And the 13th step shows how predators are making the road to recovery even more difficult. I love this show so much that I'm going to wait six months or so and dedicate a whole episode to reviewing this show in its entirety and give updates because I have a feeling more information is going to bubble up to the surface. This reporting is only just the beginning. So run, don't walk to the 13th step. Now for my miss of the week. We have Queen Havoc and her murder cult. Here's a rundown from the show. Cecilia Stein has been called the, quote, Charles Manson of South Africa. The criminal mastermind helmed a quasi-Christian cult and convinced her followers to kill 11 innocent people without spilling a drop of blood herself. Yeah, this is totally a personal preference, but anything that has to do with exorcisms and getting possessed by the devil is a hard pass for me, dog. I gave it a try, but literally like two minutes in, they start playing a recording of what is supposedly a real life exorcism, and I couldn't shut my flare off fast enough. I don't logically believe that a person can actually get possessed by the devil, but that recording brought me back to my fifth grade self watching the movie of the exorcism at a sleepover. Dude, that movie messed me up. I don't think I slept for the next two years and I still get the heebie-jeebies just thinking about it. So yeah, maybe I'll tune back in after I get some therapy. But for now, I'm going to have to send Queen of Havoc and her murder cult down my podcast queue trap door. Find out next week what show will be in the number one spot now that the 13th step has concluded. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what shelf fell through your podcast queue trap door. 
I will meet you back here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next speeding fix. That's all for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review and tell your fellow partners in crime to tune in to True Crime Feed. Thanks for riding along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.